While we're waiting, uh, thank you all so much for coming tonight. This is uh, replacing our regular programming for the third Thursday lecture series we have here at the school. Um, tonight, we thought we would take an opportunity to talk about the college application process, um, what's important, what's not as important, the things you should be thinking about as you prepare. I see we have students in the room who are uh, in all different uh, grades in high school, so um, hopefully this will have uh, useful information for all of you. Um, if you're a senior, some of this may seem a little redundant because you're probably in the thick of this right now, but for those of you that are wondering what to expect as you start your college journey, hopefully tonight will be helpful. We're going to start, I'm going to give a very general rundown of what to expect as you're applying for colleges. Um, it'll have lots of dry, boring information in it, so uh, bear, bear with me. Um, and then I'm going to invite up a panel of our faculty here um, at the school, and you are going to have an opportunity to bombard us with all of your questions. Um, whatever you've got, whatever anxieties you have, whatever concerns you have, whatever things you're interested in learning more about, um, we'll, we'll be here to answer those. The faculty that are joining us tonight are the faculty that are on our what's the name of the committee? It's like College Preparedness or something like that committee. Um, Mrs. Gilbert put us together, um, and we're the ones at the school that sort of determine the, uh, the programming that we're gonna offer to make sure that our students are prepared to represent themselves well as they apply for colleges. Of course, everything we do at this school is, applying, uh, is preparing you for college in the, in the real way. Uh, your students are, if you're a student here, hopefully you can you know, attest to this. Uh, they're, they're reading, difficult books, and they're being asked to comprehend them. They're being asked to express themselves in one-on-one -on -one oral examinations, which is harder than most college, which is a harder thing than, than most college students ever get asked to do. Um, they're taking rigorous math and science courses. They're participating in clubs and organizations. They're given free periods where they have time to manage themselves, hopefully well. All of these things are doing the real preparation for college, so we have no concerns about any of your students, and if you're in the room, yes, we have no concerns about whether or not you'll be successful in college. We know that you will be. We're going to talk about tonight how to make sure that you're asking the right questions to make sure you find the right institution for you. Um, there are three million college freshmen entering the university system every year. There are 4,700 degree granting institutions in the United States. That's a lot of kids, and that's a lot of choices. Okay, so you're one in a pool of many, many, many people who are having this conversation at home and in their schools, and uh, there are lots and lots and lots of different institutions and different kinds of institutions that deserve your attention. So we're gonna start with that, and then we'll do the panel, and then finally, um, we're gonna invite Dr. Stacy to tell you a little bit about uh, you'll probably be able to tell what our values are as a school as far as what we hope is the, for the education for you if you're a student or for your student if you're a parent here. You'll be able to tell. And so when Dr. Stacy talks to you about the college at St. Const Constantine, you'll realize, ah, okay, well, we have opinions about education. Uh, we think there's a good way to do it, and we think there always has been a good way to do it, and so we made our very own college so that we could do it right, right here. And we'll, we'll give you an opportunity to hear more about that as well. All right. So first, I love Calvin and Hobbes. I feel like Calvin and Hobbes have something to say in almost every situation that you find yourself in as an adult. So when I was thinking about uh, preparing for college and all the uh, information that you're gonna be sifting through and decisions that you have to make, uh, this strip spoke to my heart. Calvin says, the more you know, the harder it is to take decisive action. Once you become informed, you start seeing complexities and shades of gray. You realize that nothing is as clear and simple as it first appears. Ultimately, knowledge is paralyzing. Being a man of action, I can't afford to say that. <laughs> and then Hobbes says, you're ignorant, but at least you act on it. <laughs> um, there is no perfect soulmate college that every single person should go to. There isn't one institution that's doing the only correct thing in the United States that every single student should be trying to find. Um, we believe that God's will uh, may be directing your path, and we hope to help you find that path, but we also believe that Providence has a way of working things out. My sister Emily and I had to go to the exact same liberal arts college. She went there because she wanted to get an excellent nursing degree, and they had a fantastic nursing program. 
I hated following in my sister's footsteps and was fully intending to absolutely not go anywhere near any college that she went to, but then they offered me a basketball scholarship and had an incredible great books program, and that's what I was looking for, so we ended up going to the exact same school. God, it's a funny way of uh, making uh, fun of your plans, right? <laughs> Okay, so first I want to talk about what kind of colleges are out there. Um, there are lots and lots of different types of schools. You may already know what type of school you want to go to, but I just want to make sure that everyone knows about the categories. First we've got vocational schools. These are trade specific. If you want to be a welder, if you want to do um, any sort of basic technical trade, there are schools for that. Um, you may not end up with an accredited degree, you may end up with an associate's degree. So it may give you two years of, um, of credits that you could then transfer to another institution, but it's not always a guarantee. Uh, so if you're looking into going to a vocational school, you want to make sure that you understand what your options are depending on that, on that institution. Many vocational schools are for profit, okay? That's very different than non-profit. Uh, they have different goals. Sometimes their different goals include getting as many students to enroll, enroll as possible and then not taking care of you very well because whether you get a degree or not is immaterial to them once they already have your money. So be careful about that. Uh, there's another, another type, research universities. These are the big, big, big schools. This is where the professors are mostly being paid to do the research, which is the reason that the institutions have been given millions and millions of dollars, okay? So they're getting funding from private institutions, they're getting funding from the government, they're conducting research. The faculty are very busy with that research, and their students, the graduate students, are very busy teaching your classes. Okay, so this is where um, UCLA has 43,000 undergraduates on their campus. Now, if you go to UCLA, who's teaching your classes? It's not the big wig professors whose names are on TV and who are sitting up in their offices doing research, right? They're very busy, but the kids they're teaching, their graduate students, they're the ones that are teaching your classes. This is where you're gonna see um, large lecture hall classes. You may be in a class that has 500 other people in it um, if you're taking introductory courses and things like that. Research universities have um, enormous benefits if you're really into mega athletic events. You might want to go to a research university. They usually have very prominent athletics programs. If you are hoping to get connected into a giant alumni network, so that if you if you believe that you know who you know is how you get a job, if you want to go to a school where you can guarantee that there are 250,000 alumni who may be interested in helping you get a leg up after you finish your college career, maybe you would be interested in going to a research university. There are lots of great reasons to go to one of these. If you want to, if you hope one day to get into, an, uh, into a field where you hope to be given money to do important research in, uh, you know, cure, if you want to cure cancer or something like that, you may want to go to a research university because that's where the money for those kinds of projects is, okay? Um, you also have liberal arts colleges. I'm, I'm giving little examples, by the way, underneath about uh, of what, what these institutions are. You've got liberal arts colleges. Uh, liberal arts, does that mean they are politically left-leaning? No. Um, <laughs> liberal arts, the liberal arts, the seven liberal arts, it's, it's a classical notion. It basically means these are the things that any man who wishes to be truly free ought to study. If you don't want to be a slave to uh, the things that this world offers, if you don't want to be a slave, slave to fame and money, if you want to truly know what matters in life, uh, you should study the liberal arts. Um, usually a liberal arts college is going to require you to generalize. They're going to make you take a common course of study. You'll be studying English, philosophy, history, science, mathematics. No matter what your degree is, you have to do that sort of general course of study first and then you'll go on to be more major specific after that. Um, liberal arts colleges offer, this doesn't mean they don't offer great pre-med programs. Um, great uh, other, you know, biology programs, uh, great business, economics degrees, things like that. All of that is still available at a liberal arts college. It's going to be much smaller. Remember I said UCLA has 43,000 undergraduates. Most liberal arts colleges have, oh, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 10. If you find a really good one, the student ratio, whoo, that's a good student ratio, student teacher ratio. Um, it's professors who are not, usually they're not getting paid to do research, which means they're getting paid to teach a kid. So you're going to have classes with the actual professor. The class sizes are generally going to be much smaller. 
If you want to do programs like engineering, there are some liberal arts colleges that have partnerships with other larger research universities where you can complete the first part of your course of study at a liberal arts college and then transfer those units. Remember, any units that you complete at an accredited institution, you can transfer. You just have to speak with the university that, that you're interested in going to. That means the dual credit courses that you're receiving at our school right now, you can transfer them into places. Um, liberal arts colleges, um, are especially that's going to be where you're going to see you know, having to get required courses out of the way in a variety of subjects, okay? Um, and then there are hybrid schools. Baylor's a great example of this. Baylor has a giant research institution personality, but they also have liberal arts. Um, the liberal arts is a core value at Baylor, so they are kind of doing both. And you'll see a number of institutions that are sort of they've got their hand um, in both types of education, okay? So this is sort of a general breakdown of the kinds of places in the United States where you could end up going to school. Um, where should you personally apply? Um, that's a great question. I said there are 4,700 schools in the United States. Should you give all of them your email address? No, they will all email <laughs> Remember, they don't know. Uh, you may be the next Albert Einstein and your parents may be mega millionaires. So any institution who gets your information, man, they're gonna hunt you down because they're eager to have your Vaps of dollars in their coffers, right? There's a lot of money that comes with every student that goes to a university. So they want you as much as you may want them. Um, so you need to know what you value in the kind of place that you want to go before you start um, spending a lot of time and effort researching these, these institutions. So here, here's a, a small smattering of the questions that you should definitely be asking yourself. Do you want to go somewhere close to home or do you want to go far away? Some students are like, woo, I'm moving across the country, it's going to be incredible. I'm going to pack my little tiny car and do an epic road trip. Um, some people want to go home and let their mom do their laundry on the weekends. There's nothing wrong with that. No, there is. Um, I'm sure your moms would say there's something wrong with that too. Uh, so you need to think about whether you want to stay close by or you want to go far away. There are hundreds of universities in Texas alone. Obviously, you could stay in Texas and still be quite far from home. You could drive for 12 hours in Texas and still be in Texas. Um, but that's something that you need to consider. Um, are there specific majors or academic programs that you're interested in? If there aren't, that's okay. Guess what? More than a third of college students change their major at least once. 28% change it twice. So e unless you're one of those people that has had a burning passion, no, nope, even if you're that person who's had a burning passion to study one thing your whole life, you might go to college. If you go to one of those liberal arts schools, they're tricky. They'll get you in a history class and you'll realize you're in love with history. Or they'll get you in a biology class and you'll realize, actually, I do love science and I'm interested in pursuing that anyway. So major changes are totally normal. It doesn't mean that you're failing in your purpose-driven college life. Okay? Um, weather. United States does not all have the same weather. Um, how do you feel about snow? How do you feel about, oh, how do you feel about 90 degree heat mosquitoes? We already know how you feel about that. You live in Houston. Um, there are lots and lots of different places you can move in the United States. Um, do you want to go to school next to Disneyland? These are great questions to ask yourself. What kind of weather do you want? Um, how's the food in the cafeteria? This is really important. Um, people always joke about, people always joke about, you know, like the freshman 15, like you eat really unhealthily when you go to college. And that's sort of true, like as someone who mixed ice cream and Lucky Charms in a bowl and ate it like at, for dinner every night when I first went to college, um, I can attest to that. You're going to make funky choices because you're on your own. But uh, the quality of the food is, uh, is important. It's, a, it's an important thing, trust me. Um, do you want to go, do you want to be one in a sea of 10,000 people cheering your, team, your, te your uh, school's football team on? Um, if that's what you want, you should look at schools that have that. If you are perfectly fine with going to a packed basketball game that has 250 people in it, then that's not necessarily something you need to think about. But some people, that's a, that's a huge value for them. And sometimes people don't realize that's a huge value for them. They don't realize that they're in their head, they've been thinking that is the true college experience until they think about the prospect of going somewhere where it doesn't have no massive football team. Um, is there a family tradition? Do you have parents or grandparents or aunts and uncles that have all gone to a certain institution? Does that guilt you into going there? Does that make you passionate about going there? That definitely makes the college more interested in admitting you because, you know, Family uh, admissions is, uh, is a great way to, to keep people coming through the doors. Um, what kind of culture is there at that school? 
Um, this is one that you often won't be able to tell until you go on a campus visit. If you're seriously considering a handful of schools, I highly recommend going to a campus visit. A lot of schools will have, well, every school has preview weekends. That's when they roll out the red carpet. It's the time that's the best cafeteria interior food there is all year long, right? That and grandparents weekend, that's when the chefs are actually making, you know, the fancy food. So don't judge the cafeteria by preview weekend. Um, but that's where you'll get to, you know, sit in on a, sit in on a class. You'll be probably you'll uh, sleep in a dorm room with a with another student. Um, <coughs> students get paid like 20 bucks a night to let uh, you know like prospective students sleep on the floor in their dorm room. So uh, so you can sort of experience what living in a dorm is like. Um, if if you if you grew up in the Midwest, is it going to be different to go to an East Coast school? Yes. If you grew up in Southern California, is it going to be different to go to school in Alaska? Yes. Um, <laughs> The culture of the institution varies depending on what the kind of place it is and the kind of history it has. And then that sort of can determine how comfortable you are there. If you really want to push yourself and get out of your comfort zone, that's one thing. Um, but if you're looking for an institution that makes you feel comfortable, um, you'll need to go and spend some time on that campus to really understand it. Everyone pays people millions of dollars to make their websites, right? So we don't judge institutions by their websites. <laughs> we have to go get boots on the ground. Get a feel for what the place is like. Meet some faculty. Um, don't just talk to people in the admissions department. If you know what you're interested in studying, you've got to get a hold of their admin. Get a hold of a teacher. Ask, it, ask it if you can have office hours with a professor. Do what you can to figure out exactly. If you can imagine where what you want to do, figure out exactly where you would fit at that school. Because if you just talk to the people whose job it is to sell you on the school, you really don't have a guarantee that you understand what the place is really like. Affordability, I'm going to talk about this in a minute. There's like a whole other slide for affordability. Um, there are some schools that cost $75,000 a year. There are some schools that cost $9,000 a year. Uh, you, have to, you have to decide exactly what affordability means for you and your family. Do you value small class sizes? Do you value personal mentoring? Uh, do you value name recognition? I talked a little bit about this with alumni networks and things like that. Um, these, are, these are really important questions. If you're the sort of person who is completely self-directed and can get, can get your work done no matter how little attention that you get individually from the professor, then you might do just fine in a giant lecture hall full of people because you're getting your assignments in and you're clicking that you're present on your little remote control that they sell you and you're, you're, you know, you're recording, you're taking notes off of the lecturer and you're studying for your exams and you know, you'll be fine and that's great. If you're the sort of person who thrives on being able to meet with the professor after class to work on whatever it is that you covered in class, if you're the sort of person who wants to be able to uh, get together with your entire class to study for an upcoming test or something like that, then you may be the sort of person who uh, small class sizes would be a priority for. Um, personal mentoring, again, this is just how much time that you're paying people to get educated, right? When you go to college, you are paying those people to invest in you. Um, and for many people, college is an investment because they're going into debt. They're investing, they're banging on the fact that the college education they receive will be worth it, worth whatever the sacrifice and the cost is. If you want the people who you're paying to spend a lot of time working with you, then finding an institution where you're going to be able to receive personal mentoring from the people who really count, that's going to be something that will be important to you. Not just, a, not just an ID number, not just a face in the crowd. Um, and then finally, again, um, name recognition. There are obviously, there's an elite tier. There are tier one schools in the United States. If you go to one of those schools, I think 75%, uh, 75, 65%, I think, of all CEOs went to a top tier university and like 85% of billionaires did. So if your aspirations are to be a CEO slash billionaire, you should probably <laughs> go to an Ivy League school, okay? Because that's where those people come from. Um, so that's something else to think about. That, that's what you want to be. Okay, how much does college actually cost? Okay, no one pays sticker price for college. So when I say it costs $75,000 to go somewhere, okay, unless you're... Nobody pays $75,000 to go to that institution, okay? It's, it's, it's like the price of healthcare in the United States. Um, it really depends on the stuff you do in the background that's what changes what the cost of education actually is for you, okay? So there are a couple of things that happen. For one thing, I just wanted to say the average student in the United States has $37,000 in debt when they're done with school, okay? That's the average, which means that about half people have more than that, and about half the people have less than that, right? Um, that's a lot of money, uh, so it, it, it better be worth it. Um, 
So there's government aid, there's the FAFSA, F-A-F-S-A. -A. Um, if you want to apply for it, it's at FAFSA dot, what is it? Yeah. It's like dot ed dot gov, that's what it is. And it opens on October 1st. So if you're a senior this year, it opened on October 1st. It's first come, first serve. So this is government aid. Um, when October 1st rolls around, get on there, make yourself a profile. It's basically like doing your taxes, your parents' W-2s, if, if you have ever had a job as a student, your W-2s, social security numbers, you gotta fill out all this information, and then they determine how much aid they're going to give you no matter which institution you go to. Now, the institution has to accept government aid in order to, for you to get the, the government aid. So you can apply to the FAFSA and be like, woohoo, I'm gonna get $10,000 off whatever school I go to a year, I'm gonna get $10,000 off with my FAFSA. Well, if you go to Hillsdale College, if you go to the College of St. Constantine, you won't get that $10,000 off because Hillsdale College and the St. Constantine School do not accept government aid. Um, it keeps you from being required to uh, comply with a host of regulations. So if, you, if the school doesn't accept federal money, they don't have to accept uh, a bunch of different federal mandates. So you need to make sure you understand that um, when you're applying for government aid. Then there's institutional aid. So you get your FAFSA, you know that no matter where you go, you're gonna get $5,000 off a year, great. Then you apply to the school and your GPA and your SAT, ACT, CLT score, that and your GPA and maybe some essays, um, that'll determine what bracket of scholarship you'll receive at that institution. So if you've got, you know, if you're, if you're in like the top five percentile for your SAT score and you've got a 4.0 or higher, you're going to receive the maximum, and it's just a scale. Like they've got it on a chart and they know automatically how much they're going to knock off your sticker price just based on those things. Now, institutions also have merit-based scholarships um, that you might be able to apply for, so you want to make sure that you're checking for that. Um, and that would be, you're going to write an incredible essay and you're going to them so much emotionally that they decided to knock another two thousand dollars off your mm -hmm. tuition. Yeah, many um, institutions require the FAFSA in order for you to get their private scholarship yes. as well. So even if you don't anticipate needing or qualifying for government aid, you may still need to to fill out the FAFSA because yes. the institution itself will require. Yes, and tragically, you have to do the FAFSA every year. So you have to remain eligible for the FAFSA, which means you have to keep completing credits. So if you get the FAFSA and you go to school and you decide you're only going to play volleyball on the beach and never go to class, <laughs> you could lose the aid that you received if you don't progress in your degree. So you've got to pass classes, essentially. Um, and then we've got private scholarships. You've got to ask your parents, the businesses they work at, the businesses your uncles and aunts work at. You've got to check at your church. You've got to look around the city of Houston. You can get on those mega websites and pay for scholarship uh, search engine. You know, there's like monthly subscription fees and stuff. But the real money is lurking in the city of Houston, okay? So you just got to kind of put feelers out. Start asking the adults that you know. Start asking other people that you know that have succeeded in applying for college, especially if they live in our area because local scholarships are the ones that you're gonna be more likely to receive, okay? And private scholarships, it could be $175 from like the ladies ministry at your church. Hey, fantastic, okay? Um, it also could be like $10,000 from the Ronald McDonald Institution, hooray, you know, that would be amazing too. Um, there's, all, there's, a, there's, a, there's a very wide variety of private scholarships that are available out there. Um, and then finally, the other thing obviously that you have to think about that's con that, that is um, contributing to your final, the final cost of college um, how much have your, you know, have your parents saved money for you to go to college? Well, how much money is there? How many years do you attend on being in school? How much should you use per year? Those are things that you have to think about. And then uh, are you going to work while you're in college? Are you going to work while you're in college and be able to contribute that money toward your tuition? Or is that going to be paying for your housing expenses so that you don't have to pay to live on campus? Um, are you paying to eat in the student cafeteria or are you cooking ramen? in your you know, studio apartment by yourself off campus. Those are, those are things that you can consider as well. And then finally, the last thing is loans. And loans, loans really aren't financial aid, right? They're not helping you. They're helping you stay enrolled in the school, but it's a debt. You're taking on a serious debt. Um, like I said, $30,000 when you graduate. And that can, that can be deferred as long as you stay in school, but obviously there's sort of an avalanche effect going on there. <laughs> so you could decide to be a perpetual student forever and ever and never have to pay dime toward your student loans, but by the time you were finished with that, you would have a lot of student loans, right? 
Um, and so that's just something else you have to think about. How much are you willing to take on in debt in order to attend the institution that's the right fit for you? And this may be the point at which you decide which institutions are not a right fit for you. You could narrow your list down to five or six and then follow the money, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? You could narrow your list down to five or six and say, I realize this is a huge financial sacrifice, but my, the degree that I want, the professors that I love, the student culture that I experience that I'm most excited about being a part of, the service organization that I really want to get involved with, is that this institution, this is a place for me, and it is worth it to me to take on the debt in order to attend there. That's a, obviously that choice you have to make for yourself. Um, lots of people have faced that, and lots of people have chosen a very wide variety of, um, of courses of action to take, okay? So those are the things that you need to keep in mind when you think about the real question, not how much does college cost, but what are you willing to pay for the education that you want to receive? Okay, here's your college application timeline. Uh, seniors in the room, sorry, it's too late for you. <laughs> um, so here's the first thing that you need to do. Ooh, what did I do? Hello. There we go. There's John's face. Hi, John. <laughs> okay, what do you need to do? Here's the first thing you need to do. You need to take a standardized test. You don't if you're going to one of the many premier schools that are now ditching the standardized test requirement because it turns out it's not a great indicator of student success in Union College. Um, Places like the University of Chicago, a tier one institution, they just announced they're not, they're, you can still submit your score if you want, but they're no longer requiring it because they're saying this is not, it's a racket that amps up student anxiety that doesn't actually determine whether a student's going to be successful at their institution, so they just aren't going to require it anymore. We hope to see more institutions make that choice. But for the meantime, you're probably going to need to take the SAT, the ACT, or the CLT, depending on what kind of schools you want to get into. And then you're going to send, when you're taking the test, you say which institutions you want the scores to go directly to. So you don't get to be like, yes, Harvard, I did get a 1600 on the SAT. <laughs> They're going to directly send your scores, OK? So when you take the test, you say at that time who you want to receive your scores. Um, most institutions accept a composite SAT score. What does that mean? It means they take your best number from all the times you took the test. Some people are like, great, I'm going to take it 15 times, and they'll take my best No, You get testing fatigue. Take it two, maybe three times if, you're, if you see rapid, uh, you know, significant improvement from when you take it the first to the second time. Um, if you do really well in math the first time because you just reviewed all the Algebra 2 with Mrs. Nakshu, and you sort of bombed the reading comprehension section, and then you take it the second time and you do better on the reading comprehension section, but not as great on the math, they're going to take your best score from each section from all the tests that you took, okay? So that's a good thing. Um, the next thing you're going to want to do is complete the FAFSA. Like I said, it opens October 1st So if you for the next school year. So if you're a junior this year, there is no point in filling out the FAFSA unless you're actually planning on going to a university next year. So if you're a, junior, if you're a senior, though, fill out the FAFSA now. Yeah, great. It's only been open for a few days. Um, so on October 1st, you want to get in there, like I said, it's first come, first serve, okay? That doesn't mean like the first guy that applies gets all the money. <laughs> it means, it, it's, 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 not the, it's not the good version of first come, first serve. It's more like last come, not serve. That's maybe the way I should have put this. If you wait until June to do this, there may not be very much money in the government coffers left, right? They, they have a finite amount. So you want to make sure you get in there early to get everything that you're eligible for. Um, you need to get official transcripts from the St. Constantine School. Now, some of you are going to be graduating with a degree from our institution. We will then have your entire transcript for you, and you will talk to Mrs. Gilbert about getting your complete official transcript from our school, and we will take care of that. Um, if you are taking classes with us but graduating as a homeschool student, then your parents have to talk with Mrs. Gilbert about making sure that you are able, your parents are able to, to create your transcript that reflects all of the coursework that you've done, okay? So we'll contribute the part you did here with us, and then your parents will need to sort of put together all the rest of it. Now, it doesn't have any effect on your ability to be admitted to schools, whether you have a diploma from the St. Constantine School or a homeschool diploma. It's not, people are not sticking their nose at the homeschool diplomas, okay? You're going to be able to get into colleges just fine. Um, you need to ask for letters of recommendation. Usually this is a requirement on, for any college that you're going to try to get into, and it's usually definitely a requirement for scholarships. Mr. Gilbert has a robust 
uh, faculty letter of recommendation process that he can share with you when it's time. Um, the main thing that I want you to remember is ask, don't <laughs> tell. Don't say, Mr. Gilbert, you have to write me a letter of recommendation. You should say, Mr. Gilbert, I've really enjoyed having you as a teacher. And I think that you understand my strengths as a student and will be able to communicate those to X and Y institution. Would you mind writing me a letter of recommendation? The deadline is a month and a half from now. You've got to give us time. Ooh, you've got to give us time, okay? <laughs> we, need, we need lots of advance notice. So ask in advance. Think about which teachers will be able to really attest to your abilities as a student, how far you've worked, um, how smart you are, how wonderful you are, how kind you are, all the amazing things that you've done to support the community at our school. Oh, if you're not doing those things, you should do them now so we can talk about how great you are in your application, right? I mean, in your letter of recommendation. Yeah, you can, you can make that letter sound really great if you uh, contribute to the St. Constantine School community. Um, so you'll want to identify the faculty you're going to ask for letters of recommendation. And usually it doesn't have to just be teachers, right? So it could be your youth pastor. It can't be your mom, usually. It usually says a non-family member because, you know, my son Jimmy is the greatest child that has ever lived. <laughs> sure. Um, what do we really know about you? Um, and make sure you ask people who are going to be able to attest to your good character because you don't want to put any faculty member in a position where they feel like they need to tell the truth about you and that may not be beneficial to your application, okay? So live, a, live an exemplary life and we'll be able to write you glowing letters of recommendation. And then finally, you'll write your college essays. I'm actually doing a college essay writing workshop right now. I did it on Wednesday and I'm doing it again on Friday this week. The college application essay is where you distinguish yourself from the masses. Everybody's got a great SAT score. Everybody's teachers like them. Everybody had community service hours. What makes you special? You need to be able to show that you are vulnerable, that, that you, you need to be able to be vulnerable, you need to be able to show that you've learned from the things that you've gone through in your life. Um, you need to show that you can reflect back on your education and say, these are the things that have made me who I am as a person. You need to have, be able to express the passion that you have for the career that you want to go into or the way that you hope to you know, change the world. Everyone's always talking about changing the world. Um, you have to write really, really incredible, compelling essays. That's, that gets people into colleges that they should not get into based on their GPA or SAT scores. That gets people scholarship money that they maybe wouldn't have gotten if you really just compared the data, the numbers of one student to another. Okay, so you make you humanize yourself and make yourself an excellent candidate. You make yourself to the college admissions uh, counselors, they say, we want this student to be an alumnus of our institution. That's what the college essay allows you to do. Okay, and then where do you find your applications? Well, there's the Common App. There's like over 800 schools who accept the Common App, so you'll probably end up doing that. Um, it has its own set of essays. It has its own requirements. It has a very, very clear and cohesive website. So you can just go over to commonapp.org and they'll tell you what to do. There's a couple of the colleges in Texas that are on the Common App. ApplyTexas.org is every public university and most of the private schools, it's all the two-year universities as well. That's its own application. They have their own set of essay questions. And then finally, if there's individual institutions, out-of-state institutions, places like that, you just check their websites and they'll tell you exactly how to apply to their school. They want to make it as easy as possible, possible for you again, right? We want, to go, we, want to know, we want to know that the college that we go to values us as a human being, but you also have to remember there's sort of a mercenary aspect of the college application <laughs> process, right? I mean, you're like a little dollar sign and they're trying to like herd you into their institution. <laughs> so they make it very easy to apply. We'll just put it that way. Okay, and then this is just for my own, I think you, you should see this. This is what colleges are asking of people these days. The University of Chicago is notoriously creative with their essays. It's a top tier school. You get a credible education if you went there. Um, one, when I applied for college, the application essay was, how do you feel about Wednesdays? Huh, how am I supposed to answer that in a way that makes them understand who I really am? Okay, um, the required college essay questions at UChicago right now, the first one makes sense. How does the University of Chicago, as you know it now, satisfy your desire for a per particular kind of learning, community, and future? Please address with some specificity your own wishes and how they relate to you, Chicago. They want to know how you see yourself fitting into that institution. They want you to tell them all the great plans that you have for your education. Usually it's the other way around, like, right? You expect the college to tell you, here's all the stuff you can do with us, here's how you're going to fit into our institution, you should come to school here. They want you to say, I've thought about, I've thought hard about why I want to go to school here. I've thought hard about how I'm going to fit in, and I've thought hard about my plans for how I'm going to be a contributing member to this community. Um, and then you have to express yourself winsomely and with perfect grammar. We can help you with that too. Um, and, then, and then they had a five or six options 
And they're, they're crazy. They're crazy options for the second essay. In 2015, the city of Melbourne, Australia, created a tree mail service in which all of the trees in the city received an email address so that residents could report tree-related issues. <laughs> As an unexpected result, people began to email their favorite trees, sweet, occasionally humorous letters. Ima imagine this has been expanded to any object, tree or otherwise, in the world, and share with us the letter you'd send to your favorite. <laughs> huh. Do you write a letter to your volleyball? Do you write a letter to uh, a certain pair of shoes? Do you write a letter to maybe a tree? There are all kinds of, it's any inanimate object is fair game here, right? So this is your chance to tell compelling stories about who you are as a person and what has shaped you. Wow, that's, 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 just, that's just creative writing, right? I hope you're, hope you're spending some time working on creative writing during your time at the St. Constantine School. It pays off when you go to write those college essays. And then there's a bunch of other ones. You're on a voyage in the 13th century, sailing across the tempestuous seas. What if suddenly you fell off the edge of the earth? That's it. <laughs> okay, what if I fell off the edge of the earth? How is that supposed to tell them how you fit into the U Chicago? We'll work on it. It's fun. It's really fun. Okay, so we'll, we'll look at these ones. These are the common app. These are not as fun. As they never are. Um, but they are still. They are still tricky. You still have to. You still have to work for it. Um, the first one. Some students have a background, identity, interest, or talent. That's a lot of categories. That is so meaningful. They believe their application would be incomplete without it. If this sounds like you, then please share your story. This is your chance to tell them what your fill in the blank on the rest of the application can't convey. So this is not your chance to be like, and as you can see with my 3.7 GPA and my such and such <laughs> ACT score and all of my hours of community service, I'm very interested in studying blah, blah, blah. That's not what you're doing here, right? Don't you, you don't just regurgitate what you put in the application. They want you to tell a compelling story that cuts to the heart of who you are as a human being. Wow, that's a lot to ask of an 18 year old. But that's what every college wants. And when you give that to them, they feel excited about admitting you. You can read some of the rest of these. Um, the lessons we take from obstacles we encounter can be fundamental to later success. Recount a time when you faced a challenge, setback, or failure. How did it affect you, and what did you learn from the experience? Reflect on a time when you questioned or challenged a belief or idea. What prompted your thinking? What was the outcome? I recently advised one of our current seniors to write an essay about how they insisted on having a faculty forum where they could explain why they should be allowed to wear hoodies at our yeah. school. That makes a great story for a college application essay. Um, okay. Uh, describe a problem you've solved or a problem you'd like to solve. It can be an intellectual challenge, a research query, an ethical dilemma, anything that is of personal importance, no matter the scale. They don't care if the essay is about how you grew up watching Wheel of Fortune with your family, which gave you a passion for words. They would love to read that essay. It's actually, that's one of the top 10 best college essays of 2018 right now. Um, they don't care if you don't mention a stitch about your academics. There's one right now that's about a girl who watched her grandmother suffer dementia uh, using a metaphor for uh, creating kimchi, which is a Korean dish, uh, in the kitchen. That's what college admissions counselors are interested in learning about you. Um, I'm going to I'm going to finish up. Um, we're going to call our faculty up here, and you get to unload all of your <coughs> questions onto us. But I wanted to finish up. I'm working with um, I'm working with one of our seniors right now on honing their uh, college essays. And we got one here that, whoo, gave me goosebumps. Um, and it, it, I think it cuts to the heart of a couple of these. Uh, we'll some time, this, it could work for number three, it could work for number two. Um, it might be able to work for number one. Um, this is your chance to, like I said, say something about yourself that none of the numbers are able to represent. Um, so this is something that one of our seniors wrote. I'm just going to read it to you really quickly. And then we'll call our faculty up here. Okay, so here it is. It started freshman year when I was midway through book three of Plato's Republic, learning about censorship within Socrates' idealistic city. I was bored out of my mind. <laughs> Some of my classmates gave up and read spark notes, but I came up with a different solution. I bet my teacher that if I read every page of every book, I could find one that was not worth my time. Sophomore year, I pushed through Dante's Divine Comedy and laughed aloud when he put lawyers in the ninth circle of hell, even below murderers. 
Over spring break of junior year, as I waded through Moby Dick's outdated descriptions of whale anatomy, I thought I'd found the book to win my bet. <laughs> when Captain Ahab's ship was torn to pieces by the whale, I expected a stereotypical comeback that never came. The last three chapters shocked and captured me with the innovative brilliance of Melville's writing. Last summer, I thought I had finally won with War and Peace. <laughs> but as I trudged with prisoners of war through the snow-covered terrain of Russia, I experienced alongside Pierre the transcendent beauty of friendship through a shared, bre through a shared bite of bread. While I was forced to read these books by my teachers, I am now excited to dig into literature knowing that I can discover gems of wisdom. My education has been a Socratic dialogue model fo focusing on logic, rhetoric, and philosophy. Standardized testing and academic shortcuts are foreign to me. While my GPA reflects my effort in this rigorous academic environment, it doesn't come close to revealing the value of the incredible education I have received. I'm eager to continue learning by pursuing wisdom and virtue, but as Plato's Mino asks, can virtue be taught at all? I hate losing bets, but when I lost this one, I wound up winning. <laughs> it makes me emotional, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, but that's, we hope at our school, that's an essay that every one of your students can write. Those are the books they all are gonna read. Um, sorry. <laughs> And none of the numbers tell that story. Okay, back to the panel. Let's <laughs> <laughs>